now I would like to introduce today's speaker. We have Mark Bolda. He's a farm advisor working in strawberries and caneberries and is with the University of California Cooperative Extension in Santa Cruz County. Today, he's going to be speaking on the management of ligus bugs in strawberry. And so now I'm going to pass this over to Mark. So you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay, very good. Thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. Um, thank you all for participating. I think we have something like 275 uh, people participating. We actually have uh, Daniel Kirschbaum from Argentina. Welcome. I haven't seen you in a long time. It's great you're here. So again, Mark Bolda, UC Cooperative Extension uh, uh, Advisor in Strawberries and Cameberries. And so when Cheryl gave me the uh, the offer to, to present something, I thought Ligus Bugs would be a, a good one to present, kind of a it's a longer talk, so we can get into a lot of detail with this. It is a major pest of strawberry. I should let you all know, full disclosure, I am not a formally trained entomologist, but I have had the good fortune of working with a lot of formally trained entomologists, and I did notice some of you are on the call. So I really appreciate that. I've been doing uh, work on ligus bugs since 1996. So that makes, what, about 28 years of working with ligus. Again, I, I learned a lot from good people. And that's, that's how I got ahead on this. So I'll kind of try and summarize that in the 45 minutes uh, that I've been given. So initially uh, the format of the, so the format of today's talk uh, initially be biology of ligus and I'll discuss the uh, damage of ligus to strawberries. Then we'll talk about the predator complex in the field, discuss biological solutions. And then I do have one slide on pheromones. That's a topic that we should touch on. Talk then about uh, some other management techniques, a uh, utility of the bug back, uh, chemicals, and I'll make a few closing comments. And by the way, I, I think, Carol, maybe you mentioned this. If you have, so this talk clocks out at about 45 minutes, and so we have an hour, so there's some time at the end. But, you know, if you have a question, I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. I need to ask it right away. So do ask it in the question and answers. If there's not too many, I can answer them while I'm talking. Okay. So why study ligus? Uh, do pay attention to these. They do come up sometimes on the test. So uh, they do go to a great many crops, alfalfa, canola, lentils, tree fruits, vegetables, strawberries, caneberries. Caneberries, some controversy as far as the damage that they cause, but you do find them and they do find them in great numbers in, in caneberries. So that's your blackberries and your raspberries. Potatoes and then even some wheat species. So very wide range of ligus. And by the way, I think this comes up later on as well. Ligus is native to California. They've been here long before we have been, and they'll be here long after we are. So it's a, manage, it's a matter of managing them. So just so we're all on the same page here, um, I do have these slides. I, I use these quite frequently, so uh, frequent participants in my meetings are, will be familiar with these. But again, there's a lot of people on, on the call. So it's an incomplete metamorphosis. So it starts with an egg that'll come up in a moment. And so you have these small nymphal stages and each nymphal stage, I believe there's five total instars for ligus. Each nymphal stage more closely resembles the adult. The adult is here on your left. You can see, you can see my laser pointer, right, Cheryl? Coming across? Okay. Yes, we can, we can see it. Okay, good, thank you. So, and it does, the ligus do have these um, uh, light green to yellow triangle on the back of the thorax about three eighths of an inch long. Uh, this is probably a fifth instar ligus and you can start to see the beginnings of the wing pad. This one here sometimes is a little tricky. Some people say, hey, you know, that looks a little bit like an aphid, but not so fast. You do have the antenna pointed forward ligus and do notice the five black spots. And then also people who observe this closely will see that there are no cornicles, which you have in aphids. And also with aphids, you know that their, their uh, manner of walking is very purposeful. Ligus, especially on a warm day, they're gone. And so they are not purposeful walkers. They move rather quickly. The egg of ligus, I think, is something that we should spend a little bit of time on. So this is on the on the right hand side. I'm sorry, on the left hand side, did you see an egg which has been extracted from the tissue? It has sort of this shape. The ligus eggs are inserted into a tissue, which does have some management implications, which we'll discuss later. This is in the, not in strawberry, this is in a cotton bowl. The eggs will go into tissue, they'll go into fruit, they'll go into leaves. Very difficult to find. I would never, ever base a program of um, evaluation by finding the eggs. It's very, very infrequent. I, I imagine there's very few people on this call who have ever even seen one. So most of the egg, obviously, it, it's inserted into the tissue. 
And the reason for this is eggs are real. They're like candy for predators. And so you really need to do something to keep them away from predators. For example, lace wings up on stalks. Sometimes they're hidden like you have here. So those are the ligus eggs. Life cycle statistics, uh, the female lays between three to 10 eggs per day and about 15 to 400 in a lifetime. The average lifespan from egg to adult, that's those five from the egg and then the five instars, but 10 to 20 days. And then the adults live from 10 to 50 days, depending on the temperature. The warmer the temperature, the faster the ligus develop. So some of, I know we have a number of people who have been with ligus for a long time. So you're familiar with this. And this is this, this is the degree day model. I believe, I may be incorrect, this was developed mid to late 80s. And what this was doing was attempting to predict what stage of ligus would be in the field and when. The whole idea here being is that nymphal stages are much easier to manage with chemicals than our adults. They're smaller, the surface area to mass is larger, all of that, okay? So what this was trying to do was predict when you would have certain, certain stages in the field. And this is going back to this idea of temperature. The threshold for development of ligus, according to this degree day model, is 54 degrees. There is a degree day model. It's an algorithm. It's not simple math. Cheryl, do, do you have that link? Could you put that in the chat, please? And that, Yes, that, that's I, I can. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank, thank you so much. So you can see what this actually looks like. So as it gets warmer, the ligus obviously is an upper limit, you know, 150 degrees. That's not amenable to development but there are i think it's 75 80 degrees is really the peak time for development for ligus and so what this is doing is calculating that so what this model was doing so you had wild mustard wild radish alyssum not so much around here but you would detect the first ligus in march the first nymphs you'd see them on weeds 799 degree days later you would then detect the second generation in strawberry, okay, 799. So you could calculate that based on the temperatures that you were experiencing at that time. Likewise, in April, if you were to see your adults first in strawberries, 252 degree days later in May and June, then you would see the first generation of nymphs in the field. And that goes then first generation to third generation of nymphs, again, 799 degree days. It works. I've seen it. But your problem is, and again, our, you know, our agriculturalists in, in strawberry here know this, is all of the generations now overlap. And so the utility of this has been much reduced. And so, but I do bring this up to simply underline that when it's warm, the ligus are developing quicker. For example, today is 80. I imagine the ligus are really going to be thriving. Matter of fact, I'm doing a research spray tomorrow just based on that. So, Let's talk a little bit now about the damage of ligus. So this picture here on the on the left hand side, those of you who've seen my presentations, this is probably the 10,000th time that you've seen this picture. But again, there's a lot of people on this call, so please be patient. So what ligus does, the feeding of ligus, especially the, the nymphal feeding on the flowers, results in this folded fruit, right? It's just totally misshapen. Beautiful pictures here from Cal Poly as well. Uh, you, again, you just it doesn't look like a strawberry. I do. Sometimes photographers, they always go for the most dramatic example. You go to the field, you don't find them, you wonder what's going on. Here's a less than dramatic example. You see some folding here on this side and a folding here. That, that fruit's not saleable. All right. And so does the flavor matter? The flavor doesn't change so much because of this, but it's very seedy. And the thing is, you know, strawberries end up on the tops of birthday cakes. It's a special food. You're not, you're not going to make your child happy with this thing on top of your cake. All right, so the, the folding does, does matter. And it it really does. Strawberries, people are looking for a good shape. So this on this one, the picture on the left, you can see beautiful shape here on this. But this one's got a little turn in it. Flip it over, and we've got two or three missed seeds, so to speak. I'll explain that in a moment. And so I remember uh, presenting this to a group of PCAs a couple of months ago, and they said that would not go into the box. So it is. it does end up in a lot of loss in strawberries. So... How does this actually happen? Again, and I said this, and keep this in mind, the nymphs feeding on the flowers are the main point of damage. I don't have it in this, in this presentation, but there's a very strong relation between numbers of nymphs and fruit damage three or four weeks later because strawberry takes four to five weeks to develop, and that's when you're going to see the creasing. It's the nymphs feeding in the flowers. Okay. So let's roll up our sleeves and see how this happens. So this is a cross section of a, a strawberry flower. 
uh, just a little bit of um, plant morphology here. So these are these are the um, the stam the stamens and then the, are, which are the male parts of the flower, and then the pistils are the female part, and the pistils are topped with the stigma. Uh, strawberries are generally considered to be self pollinating. I do see a problem with this graphic. I mean, you take what you can get from the internet, but do you see this at the anthers, which contain the pollen, are actually below the stigma. So that pollen may have some difficulty getting the points of this berry. Be that as it may, let's get back to the nymphal feeding on the flowers. What happens is that nymph is on top of the flower. It's feeding on this thing, right? And it's poking around in there. And the way it feeds, it's kind of like a spider, if you're familiar with that. It's, um, exu it's, um, I don't want to use a, 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 it's just, it puts out enzymes that are softening the tissue. And then it has another straw, so to speak, in the proboscis that sucks up the dissolved stuff. So it's not like us, it dissolves all the stuff in the stomach. It actually does a lot of the uh, dissolution externally. And of course, that point right there, that is one of your seeds. The seed is actually what you're seeing a seed. It's the akine, it's actually a fruit, the fleshy stuff, the horticultural fruit, that's actually just flesh. The fruit is this akine, the feeding of that, it fails, and therefore then that part of the fruit does not make, okay? Interestingly enough, so that, that's how you get the twisting, but there's another piece to this. I think a, a number of you have seen this already, but I bring this up because a lot of people from all over the place here. I did, since 2021, I have been working with a material called planazolin uh, from Syngenta that basically controls ligate for multiple weeks, five, six weeks, there's no ligase in the plot. So basically you have fruit in a ligase-free condition and then also fruit in, you know, an untreated control where there's a lot of ligase. If you're familiar with the numbers, 20, 30, 40 ligase per 20 plants, and then the grower standard, and these fruit were smaller. All right, so very few ligase. Uh, 22 grams, and then the the untreated control and the grower standard, which is here, about 16 grams. And yes, that difference was significant. So what's going on? I show you what's going on. Is this, this is a 16 gram fruit and a 22 gram fruit. Any of you, I challenge you, go out in the field, count how many quote unquote seeds, keens, you have on a big fruit compared to the little one, and you will find the big fruit always has more seeds than the little one. So failed, my hypothesis here is that Failed seeds not only result in folded fruit, which are easy to identify, but they also result in smaller fruits. And that's something that I'm taking on this year uh, in a larger study. So now we get to the predator complex, and all these are in the same insect order as ligus, which complicates a, a lot of management uh, tactics. But I didn't write the names here, but this is the minute pirate bug. And so very, very distinguishable by the black and white marks and then some people don't know this but they see these orange insects in in the field sometimes i think it's kind of weird aphid or louse or something like that it's not this is actually a nymphal pirate bug okay this orange deal is a nymphal pirate bug then we have uh the big eye bug this is geocris and you can see it's very stout great big eyes uh generally you see those may june uh we haven't seen them at all this year maybe someone has seen them i haven't seen them all but yeah july august you're not going to see many of those uh, pirate bugs, they show up, really see them in strength in, in July. And then here you have a damsel bug. It is feeding on a ligus, so it's very, you can see the difference is pretty clear, right? You, you see the little triangle again? And this is a lot fatter. Um, and it's, you know, they do feed on ligus, but I'll tell you, damsel bugs are not very frequent in the field, but they do all feed on ligus. And we know this actually, Diego Nieto, I, who is uh, with Driscoll's entomology now, did some very nice work many years ago with a team and they examined the bot the uh, stomach contents of these predators and they found uh, pieces of ligus. So they all feed on ligus. That's great, but we still have a lot of problems with ligus. And then you have the uh, dwarf spider. Uh, they also feed on ligus, but they're very general feeders. So yeah, sure, they're feeding on ligus, but they're feeding on ants, they're feeding on other spiders. And so again, we still have ligus. This is interesting. So um, up until November of last year, we, we had a new entomologist with us, Kirsten Pearson. She was great. I mean, she was fantastic. She could identify bugs. She really knew the system, understood a lot. Uh, she has moved on. But one of the uh, insects that we found in a number of fields, as I was doing some research, I didn't know what the heck this thing was. Um, this isn't my picture, by the way. There's My pictures were, were very poor quality. But you see the spiky, very, very um, 
highly developed insect. And what she said to me really stuck with me. Those fields where we were finding, they, they feed on ligus. I mean, it's pretty, should be pretty clear that's a, a predator, but the, the fields that had those, that, that's an, an assassin bug is an apex predator, which indicates a lot of ecological stability in those fields, right? So if you're seeing a lot of these, uh, good for you because it looks like you have ecological stability in your field. Okay, and so now we go to parasitoids. Uh, this is one, I hope I pronounce this right, parasitenis uh, diginoides. And I worked together with Frank Zalem and Charlie Pickett with this uh, when I, very early on in, in my career with Cooperative Extension in 2003. And so we went out together a few times and then I had uh, these, these containers mailed to me and they had all the little wasps in there. We would release it into mustard. It was very early in the year, so the ligus had yet to migrate into the field. You can see here it's laying an egg in, into a nymph. And Charlie, already 2005, super excited, called me. He's like, hey, Mark, you know, I, I found um, I found pupae of these uh, these wasps, you know, at the edge of the field. And so it is. Uh, they have established, but we still have ligus, right? So they are feeding, but they aren't, they aren't, well, not feeding. They are active, but they are not pushing the ligus anywhere close to below an economic threshold. Which brings us then to the use of pheromones. And I, I have this quote from Jocelyn Millar. He has since retired, but Kent Dana is very active. As you know, he's giving the next uh, talk in a couple of weeks. And this was his quote, I think it was in the early 2000s. And so pheromones, you can use them to, you know, maybe use a trap to pull them in, or you could use them for mating disruption or something like that. But you have to find out the exact pheromone that is actually going to work. And they never found it. And this is, was his statement. We first started working on Ligus in the 1990s identified a lot of compounds and did a lot of testing, but we never really got anywhere. We didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel, so we put it aside. Fast forward 2015, I had a really great meetup for Ligus at my office. We had all the big names in Ligus. Everybody was there. And Kent was there and he presented and uh, they still didn't have, they had not developed any. Apparently it's a blend of some materials. He did have some pheromones to test with growers. Those went out, but again, we didn't get anywhere. And this is this is a very difficult problem. So the pheromones are not happening. Okay, which brings me now to the bug vac. Um, this is if you're not if you're not familiar with this. So this is generally mounted on the front of the tractor. There's a lot of different iterations. The Strawberry Commission, together with the uh, Strawberry Center at Cal Poly, has been working on this for a long time. So basically, it's a hood that goes over the bed. Uh, this is a four row bed, Santa Maria Oxnard. Probably ours are narrower. But um, so this one goes over here and then there's a fan inside of this barrel that's pulling upwards. And so when it does that, it pulls up like it's mostly adults. They tend to be larger, often more air resistance. And then you have a series or a, a plate of baffles, which those they're moving at high speed. They strike against the baffle are killed and it blows out the top. Very impressive. You see there's bugs flying all over the place. Uh, it, it's really great. It does it does kill a lot of ligus. There's, there's no doubt about that. However, I do need to go to the bottom line here because you, you don't win wars by killing a lot of the opponent. You, we need to get to the actual objective, which is to reduce the amount of damaged fruit. So I didn't have any anything uh, later than than this. I, I, I know that the, the Strawberry Commission and Cal Poly did a lot, but they I checked with them and they said they didn't have any fruit information. So you'll have to pardon me. I'm using 1989 data from Frank Zalem using the vacuum. So here we have number of damaged fruit per 50, right? So uh, the untreated control, it's 19.8. Uh, so actually, you know, percentage wise, that's like 40% of your fruit. So like this is a problem. That's what I've been saying from the very beginning. Weekly vacuums, significantly lower, 16.3, and then bifenthrin, that's brigade. Remember, these are very early days for bifenthrin. You will not obtain efficacy like this bifenthrin anymore. And then there was another one done, uh, again, 1989, and you're seeing something very similar. The uh, weekly vacuum, significantly lower than the entry control, but the bifenthrin is not to be beat. And then here again, we have 1990, uh, again, something of a repetition uh, using a little bit different pesticides. And again, the vacuum is reducing uh, the amount of damaged fruit, but not as much as chemicals. And that's the same down here by Fenthrin. You're, you're reducing them with the vac, but not as much as a recently introduced chemical. So just some comments on, on the bug vac. It does 
reduce the ligus. Uh, however, you know, we did a, a cost study for organics. It's not in the conventional because there, there's a, a, a group of growers that do not use them. And so we, we don't, we didn't think we should put in it. But for organic, the, the growers are using them extensively. And so the bug vac, and this includes the amortization of the tractor, the vacuum, and the tractor's dedicated to the vacuum. You can take, you know, take it on and off, and then you have your driver. So that's thirteen fifty a year, and then compared to thirteen eleven, including your miticides, fungicides, and everything. So for a single pest, you are people be aware of this. I mean, fifty percent of your cost is just for ligus when you use something like that. It is a non-residual method of control, meaning it must be repeated. And I did go through the literature, and actually, I took a lot of time, by the way, to write this this presentation up. These things are tough. So in reviewing what, what was available in a 2014-2015 study done by the Strawberry Commission, even a field intensively vacuumed that's twice a week, a rapid rebound of ligus populations in regions of the field gave cause. So they just kept coming. I mean, you suck them out and they got more coming. Gave cause to thinking that even more frequent vacuuming would be necessary. So at least three vacuumings, I'm assuming, maybe even four a week. It's non-residual. Okay. So that brings us to the last section of this is chemical management. So chemical management can be efficacious. Uh, you do have a lot of problems with resistance and chemicals. And then also the difficulty in registering of new materials. And at this point, I'd like to say is, you know, looking for new chemicals isn't just testing them. It's also maintaining a network of people who are looking out for you, right? I mean, for us, berries is everything. It's our world. Everybody we know is in berries. But for a chemical company looking at a crop that tops 40,000 acres to, let's say, rice or soybeans or corn, I mean, the acreage simply is not there to eagerly register new chemicals. So you do have to have people that are looking out for you. And I really, I, I feel I do. I, I, I have a nice network of people. And fortunately, then you'll see it in a moment. We have had a, a, a number of new materials come to the fore that we've been able to test and they look like they've been fairly efficacious. So let's look, let's just look at the background of chemicals. So we got Dan, so we're looking at pyrethroids, Danitol, Brigade, uh, again, not nearly as efficacious as it used to be. Organophosphates, malathion is the main, carbamides, I put this in with hesitation. It has a seven day PHI. I don't think this is being used a lot. It's also uh, pollinators are very sensitive to it. So this one's not really used. It is a carbamate, so it's in the list. And then you have uh, newer active ingredients, uh, newer, right? I mean, Nivaluron came out like 12 years ago, Flonicamid maybe, what, 10, 12 years ago. So those are newer that are being introduced. And you'll see some other ones here real soon. So this is a study I did together with uh, Plant Sciences in 2006, again, reaching back, but it, I think it gives us a good slate of materials that you can look to compare. So here at the bottom, you've got your untreated control, uh, we do include a neonicotinoid, and the reason I didn't put them on the list, neonicotinoids have become very difficult to use. But it is interesting using the neonicotinoid Octara at the full rate of four ounces and how it compares to the reduced rate of 1.3 ounces, right? Have a look at that. So this is six days post. Application, wait six days, and we sampled for nymphs, and then we sampled for adults. And you see the number here on the bottom, and that is per 20 plants. Uh, Prevam, we did include an oil in this. That was an oil that they were involved with at the time. And you see that that is not significantly different than the untreated control. But all of the chemical treatments did uh, result in significantly no lower numbers of nymphs. The adults, you don't see any letters, which means there's no significant differences in adults. And this is a pattern that happens again and again. Your reduction, your movement between your treatments is going to be in the nymphs and not the adults. And now 13 days post, again, one application, 13 days post, the big C means everything significantly lower than the untreated control and, and also lower than the Octar at 1.3 ounces, okay? I tend to, I'm speaking now to researchers who evolved in Ligus, 13, 21 days post, that's your sweet spot. That's where you really want to pay attention and make sure that you get these. I don't include the adults on this, uh, on this date because there was no significant difference. All right, so now we now we update our chemical work. I'm, I've been very active over the last few years in uh, seeking out new materials for ligus. And one of the things I also do when I um, do this work, it, it's a bit of a passion of mine is, is um, 
trial design. And so I'll, I'll make little outtakes on, you know, I, I think what works best when doing chemical trials. And also I do, and I encourage others when, you, when you're collecting samples for ligase, count all of the predators and count all of the beneficials because it over time, I think if we get a big enough data set, we can start to see perhaps some correlations between numbers of ligase and numbers of predators. It, it could be useful, it could be useful. So I'll summarize, uh, this is a trial, Mark Demkovic, uh, thank you, Mark, uh, from, from Syngenta, uh, came to me uh, early in 2021 and, and proposed that we work with this new material at the time called uh, planazolin technology. And so we went ahead and did this. It was in a second year strawberry field. And so it was early, right? June 9, June 21, and June 29. So more or less uh, seven to 10 days difference. And then 2022 was a seven day gap. So every seven days, I go out and apply the planazolin. Plot sizes are rather large, 600 square feet, very likely the minimum. And so I was able to determine this because the planazolin actually works, right? Because most of the time you do chemical work with ligus, you don't really see much. And you don't know, you know, is your plot size too big? Is it too small? But with this one, it actually worked. And so we had, the problem with ligus is, you know, one, they have wings, and then two, they, they move around. So if you have a little bitty plot, um, I, it's hard to get treatment separation because, you know, say you're next to the entry of control and you got, you know, 20 ligus for 20 plants and here you got zero, it'll just fill it in, right? But the problem, you know, with a new material, see, this is, you don't have this problem with wheat or broccoli or lettuce or anything, but your crop destruct costs are phenomenal. Strawberries are $100,000 per acre, right? And so if you need a quarter acre to run your trial, that's $25,000 of strawberries just to get started. We need to know the minimum size you can do good ligus work with. And I think it's 600 square feet, which measures out to be four, uh, look, yeah, six, four foot wide beds by maybe 25 to 30 feet long. So there's three rates of planazolin in this trial. And then uh, Cormoran, they, they want it in. So I, I put them in as well. That's a mix of acetamiprid and novaluron at 12 fluid ounces. I don't think the company is around anymore, actually. I don't know if this is available. Mustang Max, that was intended to be my um, grower standard. It was, I thought it was uh, ready to be registered. It hasn't yet, and I think the company has lost interest. Pyrethroids aren't the thing anymore, you know? But still, it's a pyrethroid, so it's a good stand-in for a grower standard. Untreated control, all treatments applied with one quarter fluid ounce per gallon water carried, dynamic surfactant. Growers always use surfactants. They help you a lot. And then this is 2022, and again, three rates of planazolin, uh, Cormoran was gone, Mustang Max, and then the untreated control, and again, the dynamics are factor. So evaluations, again, these, in this case, it was uh, the, the uh, treatment replicates were four beds wide. So I would go, when I did my sample, I'd sample the inside of one of the middle beds, week one on the right, week two on the left and then week one and then week three on the right and so forth. So because I'm removing the ligus from the field. Beatbox method, um, this, I know Hillary Thomas when she was with the Strawberry Commission started doing this. I think it's a good method. Um, it, and I'd like, I'd like people when they're doing research to use those because then we all getting the same kind of results. So each beat three times firmly on the side of the plant. The plants, the, um, the samples were then collected and frozen. If you don't freeze them, they're all running around and it's hard to see. Also again, speaking to researchers, maybe to some extent PCAs, to maintain sampling integrity, all samples were taken between 10 a.m. and noon. You go too early, there's too much dew on the plant, so you don't get much off. You go too late in the afternoon, and it's a little warmer and the ligus are a little deeper. So what happens if you vary your sampling times, you may actually have more variation between your sampling time than you do between your treatments. So keep the sampling time consistent. And again, everything bagged, froze, and evaluated in dissecting scope. And then also 2022, which I will present, harvest was taken from the intermediate planazolin rate and the entry control, and then the Mustang Max, which is a grower standard. So let's have at it. I'm going to use the 2021 results. They're very similar to 2022. 
So uh, you see the three applications right here, one, two, three, those are the blue arrows. And you can see uh, all the way up to uh, July 6, all the treatments were significantly lower than the untreated control. But past July 13th, it was only the planazolin treatments and this one all the way to the 10th of August, six weeks of very little ligus. Look at the untreated control. If you understand your ligus, we're close to 40 ligus per 20 plants, is per 20 plants over here. 40 ligus nymphs per 20 plants. At the same time that my planazolin is between two and three. So it works very well. Uh, ligus adults, I did say that some it can be difficult to get differences. We were fortunate we did get some differences. Do notice that the numbers of adults are a little lower than the nymphs. And it should be, right? The, the adults are always less than, than the nymphs. Also do notice, and this goes back to what I was talking about, the difficulty of deploying the degree day model is all these data points are the same dates as we collected the nymphs. So you got you got adults mixed all together with the nymphs. It's not it's not discrete at all. Anymore. And so fruit twisting, this is your cat facing. Uh, June twenty five, we only had uh, two applications by then, and you know they'd only started maybe two weeks before. You don't see any twisting. The effects haven't kicked in yet. Now you do. July twelfth, you've had you've had uh, four weeks between the on the commencement of the applications and the untreated control right here, very significant. And look at all the way out to August 12, everything else is now, it's it's broken down. But the, plana, the planazolin treatments, oh, I'm sorry, the planazolin treatments are right here, very, very low fruit twisting. And then up here, the uh, Cormoran and the Grower Standard Mustang Max are equivalent to the untreated control. So they've completely broken down, while the planazolin absolutely has not. Very good material. This is from 2022. I did some uh, harvest to see what's happening with our yield. And um, by July 6, again, the planazolin treatment and it's IS, it, the number was ISM 555. It's the same material as planazolin. Okay, this is it. So 2680 boxes per acre, the total untreated control, 1685 boxes per acre, where we use the Mustang Max. 1874. And again, you can see that the planazolin, planazolin, sorry, all the way up to the end of August, uh, continued to maintain those yields above that of the grower standard. Just one note here. I've, I've said this before. August 30 is as far as it went, because at that point, I, I believe you saw it on the chart. I was about 80 or 90 ligus per, um, per plot in, in my untreated control. And the treatment threshold for ligus is still ostensibly one. So I was very, very far above the treatment threshold. I was actually infesting the grower's field now with my project. So the PCA called me and very politely asked me to, um, could they overspray it? And I said, absolutely, but I ran out there and got a last sample. So what I'm saying, PCAs and field managers, growers, talk to us. When you're working with us researchers, talk to us. We'll take care of it. I don't want to damage anybody's business. And I'll, but I do want to get a last sample out of that plot. Very important to me. So this is 2023. Now people are starting to get interested. So the planazolin is still going. That's great. Mark continues to support us. BASF, uh, Safina with two different rates. And then FMC with their belief already registered, but then their 2B registered of Avon Evil uh, right here. So we have these three novel insecticide treatments. And then we have the grower standard. I put that together myself. After having talked to some PCAs, we began with Ryman, Malathion, Danatol, and Octara. I like this mix, and I don't know if you can still use the Octara at the rates that are, are effective, but that, that one does work. And the entry check, all treatments applied with widespread max. That seems to be something that people are using now. Six fluid ounces per 100 gallons. Uh, 150 gallons per acre water carrier. Sprays always done early. That was with the other ones too, near windless conditions. Uh, started late, August 3, 10, and 18th. Remember 2023, those of you who are not in California, we had a lot of flooding. And the whole season got delayed by six weeks. Two, I was trying to keep my costs down, and so we started a little bit later so I wouldn't have to deal with all the crop destructs. So the valuations, uh, this was done now by Plant Sciences, so the valuations were not in the beat box. And ligus and beneficials evaluated weekly by sweet netting and counting in the field. Cat facing measured weekly, starting several weeks after the last application, because there is a delay, because the nymphs are feeding on the flowers. Here it is. There's a tract application. Very precise. I like working with PSI. They do very good work. 
So uh, you do see the first thing that strikes you, This is these are now the results. Ligus nymphs, the whole population is declining. That's because the flowers are declining. I mean, we're going to the 15th of October, but still we do see a lot of differences between the untreated control, which is this red line, and all of your treatments, including the grower standard. The grower standard is down there as well. And then here you have Ligus adults, not seeing any differences except for this weird date. Uh, must have just been a lot on that week. And that one is significantly higher than all the other treatments. But after that, there's no differences between any of the treatments. It's luck of the draw. So total ligus, I, it looks a lot like the nymph chart, simply because the nymphs just flood out the adults with their high numbers. So again, total ligus is very similar to what you see with the nymphs. I do want to use this chart to make a comment about the beneficials. I have spiders, and the next slide will be pyrobugs. So here's the three applications. One, two, three. This have significantly less dwarf spiders in them than the untreated control. It's one, two, but after that, they all go to the same. Same with the pirate bugs. Two weeks after last application, significantly higher in the untreated control. But after that, they recover, even though the whole population is declining. The whole population is dri being driven by other things than the spray itself. I shouldn't say they recover, but they are no longer any different than any of the treated plants. Cat facing, again, it's, it's the same as what you've seen before. We started reading it September 6th. Just to remind you, we stopped spraying mid August. So that would put this first cat facing read, what, three, that'd be three weeks after the last spray. And you see very large differences in cat facing and the uh, treated plots. And that continues on then to uh, October, pretty well, October 2nd, October 10th, we're starting to see some breakdown. 2024, what am I doing in 2024? What I'm trying to do is answer this question, which was posed by William Allen and Malcolm Douglas. Pink sheets, green heat, green sheets, the Strawberry Commission has them all. Bless them for doing it. It's great. Go back and read these. I know some of you have read these. These are, these are really the greats of our industry writing to us 50 years ago. In time, we hope to have data that will show us how much cat facing can be expected from various population levels of legacy. 2024, we don't have the answer. So, this current study, which is looking, we started harvesting even before we did any spray. It's costing me a ton of money, but we're going to figure this out. Current study will test season long effects of highly effective treatments, grower standards, and tree control. So you have the comparison where you didn't treat for ligus at all against a field where you're almost clean of ligus. That is going to help us determine how much cat facing can be expected from various population levels of ligus. I'm really looking forward to doing that. I have an excellent team by my side and we're gonna get it done. So conclusion, Ligus being a native insect to California will never be eliminated, so we need to continue to learn how to manage it. Beneficials, well, nice to have around because they eat Ligus, do not exert enough pressure on Ligus to be economically viable as a control. Impact of beneficials can be driven by factors outside the insecticide sprays. I think to some extent it's hubris to think that with our sprays, that's the biggest factor in the beneficials Life outside the environment, availability of food, there's a lot more going on than just those sprays. And lastly, no one method should be seen as the only approach in a management plan. So that, that concludes my talk. I, I believe, Cheryl, do I have some time for questions if there's any? Yes, we do have time. And um, there is one comment in the, and then there's a couple of questions in Q&A. So I can go ahead and read those to you. That'd be um, great if you don't mind. Thank you, Cheryl. I'll start with the, the chat. And I it was a comment that I think came in when you were talking about the 2021 evaluations. Yeah. Um, is the reason to continue to use this method is because the economic threshold was established using it in the early 1990s uh, with Pickles and Zalem. Um, what is, is that referring to? Can, who, 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 okay. I think it was during, I know it came in when you were talking about the 2021 charts near the end. Um, yeah. And so, but it's referring to the the economic threshold. I just started, okay, I, I think I'm answering it. 
we I just started spraying when I when I could. We were above the economic threshold when we started the trial because of the oh, and somebody, I'm in. sorry, good market. Is sorry to interrupt. Somebody just she um she said this was in reference to the field scouting method. Field scouting for the 2021. And so. Uh, yeah, could could you yeah you you got could you elaborate? Because I didn't. I mean, I wasn't really scouting. I was I was collecting samples. And okay, so I think I just saw when it came in. So she said, "There's no reference to 2021. It it was in reference to the field scouting method. It corresponds to the economic threshold." Oh, okay. Well, I mean, so yeah, so the economic threshold. I mean, the, okay. Here we go. So the 2024 study that I'm doing right now, because it will start to establish at what level, you know, what level of ligus equals what level of fruit loss. So I think from that you can start, you know, it's just one year, but I hope to continue to do that. From that, you would be able to extrapolate how much damage. So if it's a single ligus per 20 plants, how much damage does that subsequently result in? But it gets complicated because you got your beneficials in there and you got other things going on. But it, at least we'll start to point to the direction. Yeah, because I know... The economic threshold of one ligus per 20 plants has been challenged. Some people say three. And so, I mean, this, this will start to point us in that direction. Okay. And then there's two questions regarding the planazolin. I don't know if yeah. I'm saying that right. Yeah, no, um, you're good. Yeah, a lot, it's a tough one. <laughs> one of them is asking if it's registered in California. And then the second question is what other insects are affected by it? No, it's not registered in California. We're working very hard at doing that. Syngenta has been very supportive. We even had a group come out from H from headquarters last year. Uh, we talked with them. We talked about the needs that we have for strawberries, you know, pre-harvest intervals, uh, things like that. It is not registered in California. Um, what is the effect on beneficials? The effect on beneficials was very similar to what you saw with the 2023 studies is that there was an impact for two or you know, two, maybe three weeks, and then they all came back. Then they all came back. Okay. Um, and then there's another one here. Have you considered doing some research with UV light to see if it can control nymphs? So I did uh, do, again, together with plant science. I still have the, the rig. Um, we, we did do a trial uh, using UV light uh, for mildew, but then we also looked at mites and ligus. And there was ligus in the field, but it didn't affect the ligus at all. And by the way, it didn't affect the mites either. And again, there's some controversy behind that, but the numbers are the numbers. I mean, it didn't it didn't affect ligus, no. Okay, thank you. So, um, and then are there any organic pesticides to control ligus? Are there any organic pesticides to control ligus? Yeah, and that's, that's why I did include the Prevam in that study. I, don't, I'm not sure if that is organically registered or not, but what I wanted to underline is that oils are generally not efficacious against ligus. Ligus is tough. Not that I know of. There's nothing that I would um, put up as being effective on ligus to spray. No. Okay. And now here is a little bit of a long one. So um, in response to your comment about Actera rates, if Actera will be the only neonic used during the season, there are no rate reductions. However, neonic applications during bloom are prohibited, which makes it difficult to utilize Actera or other foliar neonics in strawberry productions. Have you heard any additional comments or guidance from the local ag commissioners about this? I have not, no. If you if you put it during bloom, yeah, that's the it's it was an interesting study that we ran in two thousand six and that was in two thousand six. But yeah, if it's if it's happening during bloom, which as you know, are being fed on if you don't have bloom, you really don't have ligus. So um that that's unfortunate fallout of that particular judgment. That's right. Thank thank you for bringing that up, whoever sent that in. Okay, and then what about post harvest management options? Post harvest. You mean like in the can if someone could like in the basket? I don't know. That's all it says. If I don't know if uh, this was from oh overwintering adults. They just clarified. Oh, overwintering adults. Yeah. Well, okay. So, you know, if it's an annual, so strawberries in California are generally annual annual culture, so they will migrate to the side of the field. But you know, making the call to spray the side of the field, I'm not sure about. I don't, I, you know, there's, there's some issues with that. A second year strawberry, some people carry over second year. Actually, I was in a, in a second year field yesterday. It was just spectacular. It's beautiful field. 
Um, but second year uh, strawberry, it, yes, they can harbor ligus. And so some people have looked at those as being a refuge. And obviously, you know, they could spray materials that are registered for ligus to control those. Um, but yeah, the, the elimination of refu refugia and so forth, it's been talked about, but I have not looked at that very much. I can't speak to that. Um, there's been some poking around to see how much ligus is mig migrating from where. For example, if you have a lettuce field in between you and the, and the hills that are full of weeds, does that reduce the migration of ligus? That, that we don't know. It's never been done. We tried to get a proposal funded, but it didn't happen. Okay, and then it just looks like one last question here. Uh, how about the hot air being used to control aphids and other insect pests? Hot air? I don't know anything about hot air. I don't know if it's meaning the bug vac or... Yeah, well, you'd have to run in reverse. And I, I, again, I don't know anything about it, but I would have concerns about how that affects the pollen of the flower. Pollen is very sensitive to a lot of stuff. And if the air is too hot, you're going to kill all your pollen. So, but again, I don't know the method. And so I don't want to speak anymore on it. And then one just came in uh, just saying steam. So I don't know. <laughs> really? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I don't, yeah. I, so steam, I'm, I'm getting out of my ambit here, but uh, st steam has been used as a soil disinfestation technique. But, you know, obviously steam around the plant would be harmful to the plant. The steam will kill ligus, yeah, for sure. But I don't think the eggs are in the soil. The eggs are in the tissue. Okay. It looks like we still have a few minutes. I have a couple extra questions that just came in. Sure. Um, how can you tell the difference between cat facing and pollen tube, pollen tube damage? So, yeah, no, that's a good one. And I, I know um, my my colleague, he's up in Oregon now, uh, Surendra Dara. He, he had it down. I mean, he had the whole science down. But, you know, what, um, what it means are affected by frost. What it means are affected by, you know, just mispollination or what it means are affected by ligus. But what I've done for the grower, so you don't have to go through all that. Again, I mean, Sorenzo's PhD entomologist, the guy's got skills, you know, in that area. But for the grower, you know, ligus don't occur early in the season, right? They're just coming in. And what occurs early in the season is frost. So you have a lot of frost. And then, you know, three weeks later, you see a lot of misshapen fruit. That's that's going to be frost, right? Or if you have some really windy conditions and there's not that many ligus, and all of a sudden you see like a bloom of misshapen fruit, um, that most likely is the wind. But if you have a lot of ligus in, previous, in, in the previous three weeks, and then you have misshapen fruit, ligus tends, the misshaping of, of strawberry fruit really tends to uh, occur towards the end of the season. For us on the central coast, I'm thinking that's mid July all the way through September. So that's how that's how I tell them apart. I mean, you can't. Yeah, there, I think there's ways of telling apart, but it takes tremendous effort to do so. And you know, the thing is that the horses are allowed. It's already out of the barn, right? I mean, if you have misshapen fruit, it's misshapen. Okay. The next question: Any idea how effective dibrom still is? I think it's pretty effective. Did I, when did I, uh, I haven't used it recently. It's not used too much. By my understanding, it's a closed cap material, so it's not used that much. But I wouldn't say it's tremendously effective either. It's not like what we saw there with bifenthrin many years ago. And by the way, I mean, the, the chemicals that I'm working with now, Plonazolin, the Von Evo, and then the Safina, those are novel active ingredients. We're trying to get away from the organophosphates and away from the pyrethroids, those persist in the environment. These newer chemicals, by my understanding, are, are much more environmentally friendly than the previous generation. So that's what we're doing. So I, I don't know if I want to go to things like lanate or dibrome and things like that. Okay, and then it looks like just one last question here. Um, can you explain the Rubbermaid beet method and how hard to hit the plant to collect ligus? Oh, wow. That's, that's a great question. Yeah. So we use the lid of the box, right? And so um, it's, it's not a light tap. It's just a firm stroke on the plant. One, one, two, three, that's it. And then you move on. Yeah. So not, you don't whack it super hard where fruit are getting knocked off and stuff, but um, just give it a firm, a firm tap, but come on. But the plant has to be dry. If you do it, and I, believe me, I've done enough in the dew, sometimes not even dry at 10. 
And so um, the, nothing comes off in system mess. You can't read it at all. I like that method. I think it, I think it's really good. Okay, and uh, I don't have any other questions. I have a comment from David Holden that says, as always, great presentation and very professional. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, thank you to my audience. Thank you for listening, and and thank you really for the good questions. I enjoyed that. Those are those are challenging, thorough questions. I really I I like that. Thank you. So I think we're good. We don't have any other questions. And um, again, Mark, thank you so much for your presentation and answering the questions that came in. We appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you, Cheryl and Peter. You make me look good. Really, I appreciate this. This was a good team we had for this presentation. Really, thanks so much. Thank sure, you. anytime. Yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead and log off then. All right, thank you. Have a great okay. rest of your day. All right, so thank you too. Take care.